Yes. Okay, cool. So, Let's uh, talk. Uh, yeah. Now uh, we have our very first uh, keynote of the conference. Guys, Joe Joe is going to give it. It's about the little fast uh, with the uh, little fast with company. I like it fast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Joe, um, I met him in Atlanta this year, uh, he is a friend of Rebecca Woodbrook, I think she, she told you about the conference. Uh, he's one of the organizers of the uh, Blob Conference, the Father of Language, um, uh, and there is a, there's going to be a, a Sugar Law next week in Buenos Aires, uh, so thank you Joe for being here. Okay, gracias. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Hola. Buenos dias. Okay, so I have to at least use up my few words of Spanish, I know, but not very much. So I want to talk about delivering fast with confidence, whatever confidence means, right? So, and, um, so first of all, it's very good to be here at a small talk conference. This is my first time in Argentina, and, I, I, and thank you for the plug for Sugarloaf Plop. It's called Sugarloaf because the first one was in Rio, but we've, it was meant to be in many Latin American countries, and we're excited that this time we're in Argentina next week. So thank you for plugging that. And there, there actually is a small talk logo kind of hidden in there. I don't know if you see it in my image up there, but there is something hidden up there somewhere. So, And, yeah, fast, it, fast is important, right? And I'm an old small talker as well. I love small talk. You know, it's... Uh, in fact, I've been fortunate enough to do a little bit of small talk uh, again recently here in the last couple of years, and that's, that's always exciting to do. So I want to start off my talk to talk about, uh, when we talk about delivery, what does that mean? So I have a picture of something called the, the, the Kano mod model, which was really a theory of product development and customer satisfaction. It was developed really in the uh, 80s by Professor Narioki Kano which uh, that's where it kind of gets the name. And it really kind of was looking at how do we reach customer satisfaction. And so, you know, it's like as we're going on and we're trying to reach customer satisfaction in anything, what, there, there's a lot of different types of accesses that you can look at. Uh, are, are the customer satisfied? Was the execution well? How fast did we go? Did we make money with it or not? Or did we lose money? How are things going? And so there's some different ways of looking at this. And so as Agile has kind of evolved around, and Agile really came from a lot of the OO pattern, small talk community, a lot of those people that were part of the Agile, uh, did the Agile manifesto, a lot of them came from the small talk community. You know, they were really focused on customer satisfaction. And in fact, a lot of times when you look at Agilist, whatever Agilist is, right, and we'll talk about that a little bit, is uh, a lot of Agilists really focus on is you know, let's focus on the features that the real end user needs, or let's have a product owner, and that product owner really drives the features, and we'll have these short sprints and get feedback as we go. Um, but, you know, as you're going along, and, and so that's important. We want to make sure that we're meeting the requirements of what the end user or whoever our customer is, but how does that go? But as, you, as you're going along, architectural quality really can become quite invisible, you know, ex especially when the spotlight is only focused on features. And, and by the end features, there's still a lot under the hood of what's going on there. So how do we focus around that? And so here we're going along and, you know, we're, the problem is, is we're out here, we're, we're focusing on all these features going really fast, as fast as we can go. And a lot of times, a lot of people in the Agile community is worried about velocity. How do we get our velocity up? We can go really fast, you know, what, what, whatever fast means. But, but are we doing the right thing? So, you know, we have these new products. Maybe we're going to go e-biz. Uh, we're trying to innovate and try experiments. And we're going along. And what we're developing, there's a lot underneath, you know, this, this features that we need to go. And really what is below the, really what's below that waterline? What's going on here? So what are we dealing with with all these types of uh, as we're dealing with these features, how do we really support and keep this going? Because there's a lot of things below there and a lot of times things that we don't like to talk about, especially people talking about your features, your product features. They forget about a lot of the little abilities, you know, usability, scalability. Sometimes usability and security are pretty orthogonal. 
if we want something to be very usable, well, let's not worry about security. But now we're, maybe we have an e-commerce or uh, we're dealing with money, then that's a very important concept. And, and so how do we balance this? And there is certain quali- some quality sometimes are competing. And so there is a quality of being good enough, just like as Dick Gabriel wrote, Worse is Better. There's something about that, about being good enough, which was really kind of the first open source argument back in the early 90s. And so we can go along thinking we're doing well, but we have all these things underneath the hood. And if we're not keep paying attention, uh, enough attention, and hey, let's just let the, the architecture magically emerge. That's something you hear a lot in the Agile community. We, we can be going along and all of a sudden, whoa, you know, we all of a sudden hit some problems. And so how can we deal with this? You, all of a sudden, we're not going as fast as we want to. We're still going fast, but we're not really adding important features that we need to add. We're, we're doing a lot of tasks. We look busy to the boss. Uh, we, we've got a lot of things on our backlog, and we grind along a lot of solutions. But how are things going? So how about Agile? Maybe Agile can just save us, right? Uh, so there's a lot of Agile practices. One of my favorite earliest Agile practices, because back in the 90s when I was doing small talk a lot, is uh, we were doing extreme programming, pair programming. We were writing a lot of software. I had teams of developers writing, uh, you know, out in, for production systems. Some of them still alive today. And we were, we were getting a lot of this pract- uh, feedback. And one thing I really liked about XP, and this was even before the Agile Manifesto, extreme programming came out, and as Ralph had pointed out earlier, a lot of good ideas really came in small talk, a lot more than even what Ralph had, had mentioned. But XP was one of these, and this was really this more of this lightweight getting feedback quickly. That's one thing I always loved about working in small talk. You can instantly experiment and get feedback very quickly, uh, and much harder in other languages to be able to do that. You know, in extreme programming, uh, definitely when the Agile Manifesto came out, extreme programming is one of those. Uh, this was another popular one. It's, this is probably the most popular one around the world today. I travel around a lot and, and, and participate. Uh, I'm a consultant. I you know, have my own company, and sometimes I go help other companies or also go to many conferences around the world. But Scrum is probably the most popular so-called Agile methodology. Even though Agile wasn't supposed to be about a methodology, it's, it's become the so-called if you, if you want to be agile, you got to do something Scrum-like or whatever. It, it probably gets sold the most if you go to the agile conferences. But you know, really, Scrum is just about really getting that feedback loop. And it it actually was uh, Jeff Sutherland and Schwarber and Beetle. They were doing, and so, you know, and some of those people came from the small talk world as well. <laughs> and, and they were trying to make a better method even before the. Agile Manifesto came out, and then they all kind of came together, and they did the Agile Manifesto. But there's been other ones. TDD came from XP, but that's test-driven development. And, you know, and if you do it by the book, you really write your test first. Some people call it TFD. Me and Rebecca Wurstbrock has been, we put together uh, what we call pragmatic test-driven development. How can you do this and be more pragmatic? Who cares whether the chicken or egg comes first? But it was really designed about... Uh, uh, let's really think about how we're going to validate this software. But you're only as good as your tests. That's one thing I found out. Just blindly having tests, you, a lot of unit tests, doesn't automatically uh, g- give you confidence. And then here's one of my favorite, mob programming. This is a new hot topic. And I actually went and joined the mob uh, for, for a few days. So a couple, a few years ago, Woody Zoll, who they, they accidentally stumbled onto mob programming because they were trying to deliver software, and they were they didn't know how to be agile yet, but they started learning and they were they were having problems delivering software, and the whole team got together and they started doing it and being very successful. The defects went way down, and the amount of delivery started going way up, or at least successful deliveries, delivery with value, went way up. And it kind of evolved to itself. And then he wrote an experience report, which I became good friends with Woody Zoll by shepherding his experience report. And we became Skype buddies. And then we met over at Sweden at Spotify and a couple other things that were going on. And it was like, Woody, this sounds cool. And I was asking him, what's your main message that you want people that read your paper, your Agile experience report a few years ago? What do you want people to get out of your your paper? Because that's my goal with helping somebody write this, is I want to help you communicate the best to the other readers when you're not there to defend or explain it and that's why we do shepherding on that and he said my my main thing is not to do mob programming 
you know, if it works for you, cool. The main thing is constantly learn and improve. And so I was like, well, Woody, my programming sounds cool, but I want to come and experience it for a day. So I went out and joined the team. And really, it's like extreme programming but uh, in TDD, but it's up to the team. And you don't get the burnout. And you're having fun. And the whole team constantly goes. So you have four or five people going through. And, but, all, but you do strong pairing. And the, the thing about strong pairing means if I'm running the keyboard, I cannot have the ideas. If I have an idea, I have to give up the keyboard. Because then I'm going to put that idea and your spread of knowledge is going around. And uh, and they do a lot of 15-minute and rotating. And by the end of the day, I was adding value. The first day I showed up at the company, never knew what they were doing. I was running the keyboard. I was moving things on the Kanban board. It was just a cool experience, a lot of fun. And a lot of, in fact, I'm running some experience, experience, uh, experiments down here in South America at some universities with doing some of this. With The students seem to love it as well. Um, but it's grown a lot. But, but these are just practices. So these themselves don't make you agile. Agile is more of an inside thing. So it's like I know a lot of banks in the U.S. too big to fail that wanted to be agile. So what did they do? Well, they took a lot of their project managers and made scrum masters out of them. So what's the difference between a scrum master and, and a project manager? A, the title and a weekend course and a, and a thousand bucks, right? Any of you can be a scrum master. It's easy. In fact, it's an open exam, so you can just take it on the Internet and Google all the answers, right? Don't tell anybody, but one of my friends uh, convinced me to do the scrum master because he was teaching, so I said, okay. But mainly because I wanted to be able to complain about it with authority. A, a true master is somebody that I think that's been doing things like for years. I, you know, I, I look at, like Elliot, like a, a virtual machine master. Somebody that, you know, like a Zen master. You do these things for years. Um, but that didn't make them agile. They just got to micromanage the project a lot better. That's all they ended up being able to do, right? And agile is really an inside. And then you even have things like Kanban and lean development. These are all popular. And a lot of the, uh, the agile people will tell you they were all influenced by a lot of these ideas and vice versa. But there's a lot of agile misfits going on. Like simple solutions are always the best. Or we can easily adapt to changing requirements or new requirements. Or, hey, the architecture will magically emerge. Don't worry about security until way the last responsible moment. Well, I've seen, I've seen some tricks done by, you know, I, I, I'll pick on Elliot again. But, for example, there are some very complicated things you need to do so, to optimize a virtual machine. That sometimes the simplest solution is not always best. You, you, you have to sometimes break the rules. Yeah, we want to keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler, you know, from that perspective, which means sometimes you have to do things. Uh, and, and sometimes it's okay to still think about architecture. If you know this is key to your business, if this is important, you're going to have to scale. It's important to think about that earlier rather than later, uh, you know, if, if, if it's going to be the key to success. And so to think about how, how, can we, how can we deal with that? So Agile, even though it might help, and a lot of the Agile ideas really came from that small talk, get feedback, experiment kind of ideas, it in itself doesn't make you confident and you're all of a sudden going to be, you might be fast, but you might be fast to a mess. <laughs> you know, and when ultimately then you hit the brick wall, then you're just grinding, dealing with bugs a lot. And in fact, ultimately, you, we can lead to what we call, what I call code rot. Where the code can be, I mean, code can become pretty messy. I've seen enough small, I love small talk, but I've seen small talk also, C code written in small talk. Uh, it's, it's almost, it's a sin, you know, to, to see something like that. But, uh, you know what, it happens. Or I've seen some very large methods in small talk. In general, that was, you know, most people that get good at small talk, that doesn't happen. You keep your methods very small, but I've seen some, I've seen some pretty balls, big balls of mud, messy code. And part of that is because it depends on the team and what you value. It's important to look at what you value. See, neglect is contagious. And basically, if I join your team, and every time you get a new requirement, you just go and add a new parameter and hack in a case statement, make the method bigger. And if that becomes the norm for the team, then I'm going to, you know, it's like I want to fit in. And if that's what the team's valuing, uh, and especially a new person, the inexperienced person, they're learning from the other people on the team, and they can learn all these th these bad practices. And they've even done research in neighborhoods. If if I live in a rough neighborhood, 
and everybody's uh, broken window or whatever, pretty soon a lot of the neighborhood gets that way. Uh, you start getting trash. If I leave trash all around, I can, I'm setting a bad, a, a bad precedent. On the other hand, the opposite is true. If I'm in a tough neighborhood, but me and some neighbors decide we're going to take a stand, we're going to clean up our area. The, the reverse is true. You could really uplift that neighborhood. Same way with code. Sometimes some dirt is is hard to clean if you don't deal with it right away. I know I've have I've cooked now and then. I'm not a good cook, but I like to cook. I can cook some Italian food and uh, some pretty good chili. I got some good chili recipes. Uh, but I know when I'm cooking chili or especially Italian food with the tomato sauces, if I let the pot just sit there all night and the next day or whatever, that thing becomes very hard to clean. <laughs> I almost have to put water in it, boil it a little bit, <laughs> let it soak for a long time. However, if I rinse it out right away as you're going, uh, it, it can be a lot better. So if we don't deal with this, we can really lead to something called technical debt. And technical debt can grow a lot. Ward Cunningham, a famous small talker, talks a lot about it. He's got very good stuff about technical debt. And, and he's got a lot of good quotes on it. And, and let's face it, all... You can never keep your code. Perfection is the enemy of good enough. In my house, as I'm living, sometimes you get a little bit of a mess. The main thing is not let it get out of control. Same way when I'm working on a system evolving the code. I'm creating a little bit of mess, but i got to keep things clean as I go. So ultimately, you can, you, this can evolve to what I'm best known for, the big ball of mud. And it's kind of scary that this is what I'm best known for, but me and Brian Foote, my colleague there, we published this paper back in 1998, but we were talking about the most successful architecture deployed to date, our big balls of mud. Why is that? And we've all seen them, or you've used them. I mean, some of the Microsoft stuff is huge. I've seen small talk systems, many millions lines code. Uh, there's a system that you guys could use for some of your registration stuff that called PayPal. They had a single C++ class that was almost up to a million lines of code. They brought me in and was talking about how to refactor it. A single C++ class. They ultimately, they were forced to refactor it. So, I mean, these are successful businesses, though. It didn't happen overnight, and still a lot of smart people created this, and they didn't create it on purpose. It was a continuous evolution, many people, many hands. And now I'm the new guy at PayPal, and the boss, you know, I've been working there for a couple months, and the boss says, Joe, here's your chance. You get to shine now. We need some new feature. You're going to do something kind of, you know, uh, kind of like what Hernan did here last week or last month, but he's left the company. But don't break what he did. So I do the typical thing. Oh, I copy what he did. Then I do the first important thing, you know, like a, a, a dog marking a spot. I take his name off, put my name on, version 0 0.9. I've owned it now. <laughs> You know, this is now mine. And then I start hacking on it, but I don't break his, but we have a lot of this duplication spreading all the way through our system. It, it becomes like a cancer. And it spreads throughout and can cause a lot of problems. But uh, on, on the other hand, you know, there, there's some expedience about that, but if we don't take time, it can really lead to a mess. In fact, one of the examples me and Brian Foote used is we talked about even cities. So two cities were designed ahead of time. Like some software systems, sometimes we try to do that. But like Washington, D.C., for example, was a city by design. That's a, this is a picture of Brasilia. You may not know that. And I actually gave a talk about big balls of mud in Brasilia a few years ago. So it was kind of funny. When we wrote this paper, I never knew that I'd be in Brasilia. But in Brasilia is a city by design. But I've been in Brasilia. And, and it's, part of it's cool, but there's a lot of urban decay start happening all around. A city takes on a life and other things happen. Not only that, in Brasilia, they, they have all this cool architecture you go and check out. And they're like, oh, this is our national library. So I'm like, cool, I want to do sightseeing. We're going around and I'm with some local people. They're showing me around. And so I go in and I check out the national library. Where's the books? Oh, the building cannot handle any books, the weight of books. So the design by one architecture said, we, we want this cool, great-looking thing but they've missed an important constraint, an important quality under the hood. Have you seen software systems like that? Uh, you know, where sometimes it was we were thinking of one design but missed the other. So ultimately, wh why does all these lead to all these shantytown type things? A lot of our software systems look more like this rather than the Frank Lloyd Wright mile high that he'd proposed that never got built in Chicago. 
And in fact, you might claim, well, hey, everything's evolving. We're all going microservices and everything else, so balls and mud will go away, right? Not true. This was just last month in the Financial Times, big ball of mud, still referenced there. Uh, you know, they still kind of happen. So this is still relevant uh, even, even today with this. So how can we get more confidence? How can I gain confidence as I go? Do small talk? Well, small talk makes me feel more confident in general, but that by itself is not sufficient. Small talk can help, but it, it's not by itself. It's, a lot depends on what I'm doing and what do I value. So values really drive my practices. You know, if, if I value sloppiness, I'm going to get sloppiness. If I, va- you know, if I think this is important, then I put energy into it. So whatever, whatever I value it, it, it is really going to drive my practices. Now, in the Agile, a lot of this is from the Wikipedia, the typical Agile kind of diagram you see. They say, oh, what is Agile development? Well, let's see, we're really working on working software. You know, that's part of the Agile manifesto. Continuous, TDD, oh, we have these values, adaptability, okay? We want to be visible to everybody, great. Simple, unity. And oh, oh, burn down, they're always worried about how fast are we burning down the tasks we have to do and how fast is our velocity to get it done. Well, you can go very, you can burn down and go very fast to a ball of mud. You can go very fast to a mess, and then all of a sudden, you cannot sustain it. So there's some other important values that we need to look at here for being agile that I think that are, maybe it's kind of implicit in this diagram, but I don't, I like to, I like things to be explicit so I make sure I remind myself that I value these things. Like quality software, customer satisfaction. Let's get some qualities, sustainable delivery. Happy teams, you know, positive teams. Can I even maintain it? These are all important values that I should be considering as well as I'm doing this development. You know, and there might even be some other things that I can make visible to do that with. So when we really look at what are our values for Agile Lean, I mean, you have some of the core ones, frequent releases, that's good, and small talk made that easy. I used to, I could constantly, I, I love being in there. You, you got you, a hold of everything and you could experiment, get that feedback and instantly kind of experiment, change it, and go on. That's hard to do in most other languages. Uh, but, you, we, but there's also this constantly learning, building quality software, and sustainable development. So this keep learning, I think, sometimes gets forgotten. People get stuck. You know, if you're doing TDD today, and you're doing it the same a year from now than you are doing it today, you're doing it wrong because you didn't learn. Same way with Scrum. We should constantly be trying, even like an athlete, a musician is always experimenting, trying to learn new things as they go. So how can we do that? How can we sustain this? So that's an important Agile values. And something that helps with that, when when we're dealing with Agile, one thing that Agile really focuses on was trying to make the delivery size smaller. Well, a lot of times when I was in small talk, that was just the norm. You always experimented and tried small things and constantly were getting feedback. Maybe you didn't deliver it to the end user necessarily, but you could still deliver small working pieces and keep things working as you as you went. Um, and, and so delivery size, thinking about that, is it better to have these bigger pieces, bigger chunks of code, even to the end user, versus smaller things? So one thing that, that for, for me is when I'm dealing with delivery size, delivery size is key to really think about that. Because large delivery sizes can have a lot of potential issues with it. Now, one issue is, is obviously it's bigger, so it can have more potential defects. There's more things there going on, more code. Um, Even though we've done the best testing we can, really, the true test is, you know, when you you rubber hits the road. In in other words, that's just, at least the saying in the U.S. we say, is when you get out there and actually start running, driving the thing, and that's when you really get the true test, until you actually get to really see how it works and get the feedback. Some of the best feedback comes from actually running the system and getting a lot of people r- running on it. And, and so if, if you wait a long time, you're not going to get feedback till way late. Now, that could mean that we wrote a lot of code that was not as useful or as needed. And so then we still have to maintain that bloat. It's, it takes us a longer time to adjust and get that feedback uh, with all these bugs and stuff. So with smaller deliveries and quick feedback, we can kind of get our, or we can make our confidence level go up. 
And so uh, there, there's all these, uh, basically when we're dealing with these, uh, if we're able to get feedback continuously, like with mob programming, what they were doing is they were, con- they were doing continuous integration and continuous delivery. Now that continuous delivery did not necessarily always go out to the end customer, but they were always delivering at least to the QA teams and stuff like that to get that feedback for things going on. And their defects went way down, and the, the positive value things that they were delivering, they really only focused on the important, okay, Mr. Product Owner or Business Owner, you say you need this, but this is too much to do in a day. They would, you know, start ripping it down. What's the small thing that really adds the most important value and focus on that first? And a lot of times, all some of these other things turned out later, they weren't needed. Have you ever delivered a piece of software where there was features that never got used? A few of you? Yeah. Me too. Where some, but on early on, the, the domain expert says, we must have this. This is so important. And so you spend all this time writing all, the, all this energy into this, and it turns out that it wasn't easy. And, and ultimately, that can lead to some messy code, and you've got to deal with that. So delivery size can help with this, because then we, we can start dealing with some of this. So something else that is key to with confidence for me is dealing with code smells. And so, actually, in the refactoring book by Martin Fowler, even though Martin, did, as you heard, Martin didn't invent refactory, but he was a good author and he was a good promoter and seller. <laughs> so he got, we were happy from the refactory that, you know, he, he sold the ideas and it's become very accepted in industry. But they, they had a, a chapter in there on code smells. Uh, Kent Beck did some stuff originally on Ward's Wiki uh, where they had written about that. And it really seemed to know something going on. But, you know, so if you're dealing, if we're dealing with code smells, how can we, what can we do to help give us confidence and, and help us continue to sustain our delivery for the long run? So clean code doesn't just happen. You know, it's not like, okay, we're just going to engineer clean code from whatever. We have to constantly pay attention. You have to make a professional commitment to it. You know, and, and so we're not writing good code for the computer to understand, the computer can understand assembly language, right? Zeros and ones, whatever. We use uh, beautiful languages. We can get that feedback and think, change things. So a professional commitment is key for, for doing this, and that's up to us. So we as software engineers or whatever we want to call ourselves, right, architects or <laughs> whatever buzzword of the day we want to use, d- developers, programmers, whatever, uh, we, we need we have to, we have to take a, prof, a professional uh, responsibility on this, just like a, a chef. A chef has a professional responsibility, or like a doctor. They found this out in the 1800s that doing a little bit in between patients makes a huge uh, effect on survival. So back in the 1800s, doctors used to have so many people coming they didn't feel they had time to wash their hands in between patients. The mortality rate was up to 20 some percent. And they found something as simple as washing their hands in between patients, it went down to about a 1%, between 1 to 2%. That's an order of magnitude difference on the survival. Same way with our code. I think if we do a little bit of effort, and you know, and that's like that continuous refactoring as you go and keeping things clean, a little bit of like a chef washing his dishes. I have a friend that's a master chef, and I've watched him in action. And he just doesn't let the, you know, yeah, dishes get dirty, but as he's going in between something's cooking, he'll be rinsing off getting his other dishes ready. That way he can keep going at a good rate for, for doing things. Similar in our software systems, we need to look at this. So for us, we have, it's our responsibility. I call it like the Boy Scout motto because in the U.S., the Boy Scouts always kind of had this motto. I don't know if you have the equivalent here in Argentina. But if, if I go to a campground... I am responsible for picking up my mess when I leave the campground. I don't just come there, make a mess, and leave. If I have garbage, I pick it up. And in fact, if I saw somebody else's garbage and it's right by mine, it takes no more effort to pick it up. Just like refactoring, you know, if you're in the middle of a, fixing a method, rename, extract method, stuff like that, makes it very easy to do. I don't try to, refa- I don't try to refactor or clean up the whole campground. That's too much effort. But wherever I'm at, 
a little bit, a lot of small steps go a long ways and give me more confidence. So there's a lot of little things that we could do as we go to make this good and keep things good. So I, I try to make sure it's clean, it's tested. I, I'm trying to apply good design principles. So refactoring is key here. And in fact, I don't need to say too much about this, but I will say that refact- if you value clean code, if you value keeping things good, refactoring is an important part of that. Uh, groundbreaking work was done by a couple of these dudes right here. You heard Ralph talk about it. Really, our group that I came from, I was fortunate enough to work with them in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, but they coined the term. Uh, Bill Updike did the first PhD thesis, but Don and John, John Brandt was here, I think, uh, uh, last year, right? Yeah, John Brandt, he's one of my colleagues. We work together a lot. Very sharp guy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, very good. At, they did the first commercial refactoring tools focused on that. But if you value that, you know, there's a lot of little stuff that you can do uh, for doing that. So what is refactoring? Well, since we invented the word, well, we didn't invent, but we coined the term and was the first to use it, we get to define what it means. Just like if you're a mathematician and say what a group is. Well, you know, a group is this. It has closed and <laughs> associativity. Well, refactoring is behavior-preserving program transformations. You know, and in fact, uh, some of the PhD thesis showed how you could, how the program worked before worked exactly the same. Which means if there was bugs before, you have bugs after. Now usually when I'm doing refactoring, I usually kind of apply bug fixes as I go, so you start, especially in small talk, it makes it easy to go real fast, right? We get the fast kind of analogy there with that. But, but, but technically refactoring is not doing that. First you refactor it, you make Make sure your tests still run, testing is key, and then you do the bug fixes or the enhancements. Though a lot of times you do see people doing it all. And, and it's, it's always done for a reason, and most agile processes encourage or are or, or open towards doing that. They, they see the importance of that. So it's, it's kind of think, of, is it, when should we clean our code? We need to refactor, should we be doing it weekly? Once a week we have a refactoring day? Maybe once a sprint? So is it really better to clean little by little or what? And, and actually, Emerson Murphy Hill and Andrew Black, uh, Andrew Black also is definitely a pretty well-known small talk guy from the community, but they did a lot of research in industry, and they showed that really there's really these two types of major refactorings. Floss, regular, frequent, which uh, uh, Martin Fowler always talks about, it's his preferred way rather than set away a lot of time. Though sometimes you might have to do these root canal. Things become so messy. Uh, now, mainly if you're doing a lot of these little things as you go, you, you try to avoid this. But we all know, even me as I'm getting older, that no matter how much of this you do, you still may have this happen. Same way in our software. It could be that we were, we were doing the right thing, but then all of a sudden our business changed or the whole thing we wanted to do changed, so then we need to redesign the system. So that can be more of a, a major type of steps. So a lot, to, but in general, you try to do this on a regular schedule. You you, you eliminate that, and uh, they also talk about some of the main top refactorings, which I'll give you a list of what I call my safe refactorings. You can almost always do and feel good about. Uh, they they rarely break anything. In fact, some you never break anything. So if we're going to refactor, say we have a big ball of mud, where can we start? So I decided to put together my top 10 list because, you know, if you look in the refactoring book or online for the code smells, you see 30 or 40. That's too many. Well, being an old David Letterman fan, I kind of like the top 10, but really I should probably get it down to five or seven, right? Because five or seven are easy to remember. But we started with top 10, like sloppy. There's been research at good layout and not having a lot of dead code laying around. That that makes that can make huge gains into to uh, limiting defects and bugs in codes. There's been a lot of research to validate that in, in industry. But lame names. I mean, Kent Beck's small talk best practices that he also wrote a Java version with implementation patterns. That was all about naming things. How you name things is important. Um, and, and duplicate code, feature envy, inappropriate intimacy. You know, I'll, I'll go over a few of these briefly tomorrow when I do a 30-minute discussion to, to talk about some of that. You know, then, then you have the tight coupling, your switch statement and conditional complexity. Um, but being a computer scientist, I never know whether to start with zero or one. So I was actually talking with some people, magic numbers you see a lot too. <laughs> those, are, those are things as well. But if you're dealing with some of these, 
And for the sake of time, I'll go into more details tomorrow, but uh, there's some safe refactorings you should never be afraid of doing. And I'm always amazed at how many people, I mean, I go out to industry a lot, it's large companies, small companies, and how many people are afraid to do these refactorings. Rename. Ooh, I'm the new guy. Can I rename it? Wait, but he's the experienced guy. He named it this. Yeah, but he was busy and he never had time to think about the good name, and he got pulled away on something else. Rename anytime. It's like cleaning up my campground. Now, small talk makes that very easy. Uh, and with rename with small talk, it's almost always safe. You may have some other class hierarchies that have the same name and the dynamic language. Sometimes you have to think about that. But it always pops up unless you kind of make that decision of what you're renaming. Um, new abstract class, moving things up or down that's exactly duplicated. Nobody should ever be afraid of that. And here, this one, extract method. I can't believe how many times people just, they let methods get really, really, really big. And extract method never breaks anything. It just takes a big method and breaks it down into some more meaningful parts. Ralph Johnson, looks like he's not here, I can talk about him, right? Ralph Johnson used, has a kind of a pattern he does for, uh, if he sees a long method and you have a commented piece of code, he takes all the spaces out of the comment Extract method with that name. Now it's an ugly name. Yeah. But, but at least, I mean, you commented something for a reason, and that's a meaningful thing, so you can get a new method. Then, then as he understands it, then he can do rename uh, based upon that. So, in fact, Kent Beck, if Kent Beck sees a really long method, I mean, I'm talking a thousand line or whatever, two thousand line method. You usually don't see in small talk, but you can. But in Java, you can see a lot. <laughs> I've seen many in Java. But what he'll do is he'll, he'll create what they call method object. You take that method and stick it into an object. Now you got this ugliness isolated from the rest of the code. Now you can start extract method and doing things. And then sometimes you see new objects for screaming to get out from that new, that new long method. So you can create these components and push up and pull down. But you should never be afraid of, afraid of these. Uh, so these can give you a certain level of confidence. But, but if you really want to be confident, you want to validate you didn't break anything, so you must test. Testing is one of the key things that was big pr promoted by uh, refactoring and refactoring tools for safe refactorings before the Agile, but Agile definitely pushed validating the software, and, and a lot of testing frameworks makes this easier. But unit test is not enough, and you're only as good as your test. Some people, I don't know if you've heard, TDD is dead. There's been, a, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say things about that. And I say blind TDD is dead. But you, if you have good tests and you're trying to write good scenario tests around the scenarios of, of what the true way the software should work and getting that feedback, you're not just blindly writing unit class tests. You're writing more important scenario tests based around your user stories and letting that drive how you develop. And it, it can even help you develop your objects better that are more testable. But you, you still need your integration tests, all, your, all these other types of tests as well, smoke tests. So, but, but testing is key, and it really helps me gain a certain level of confidence. But one of the problems that we have as we're going along is sometimes we get stuck. Ooh, we don't have time. What are we going to do? The boss says we have to go, go, go. Come on, we need to release this. We need to get this out now. You don't have time to refactor. Well, I don't tell the boss I'm refactoring, first of all. You know, you do the right thing for the right reasons. When it, you, uh, but ultimately, sometimes I can, I'm can i refactoring, and it's easier to refactor and add that new feature than it is trying to add the feature without refactoring. It takes less time, sometimes. Same way with bug fixes. But if we don't have time, we can never make things better. That's the problem with Agile. We're caught up into go, 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 go. Red, green, red, green, red, green on TDD. Whoops, you forgot refactor red, green, refactor, and that's where we get some of our time to rethink. And so something I want to talk about is time is important as well for confidence. Have you ever seen somebody that's just frantically running around all the time trying to get something done? Are you confident that they're going to do a good job? Whereas you see the relaxed guy, you know, the good programmers are the ones that find easy ways to do the same thing. You know, they find like an order of magnitude better way. <laughs> where they can do in one day what the other busy person running around is doing in 10, and you're not very confident. So we have to find time. And so I, I've been looking at Kaizen, which is supposed to influence a lot of this continuous improvement, even though Kaizen literally doesn't mean continuous. It just means any form of improvement. It could be a one-time improvement. 
But in our industry, we've kind of grown to think of it as meaning continuous improvement. But part of this is how do I constantly get better and learn? If I'm a musician, I do practice, but I'm continually trying little experiments. That means I need time. If I'm just always putting out fires in my software, dealing with bugs and constantly trying to integrate, adding this new feature, but there's a lot of bugs and, and I don't have time, I'm not going to be very confident. So an important part of Kaizen principle, I've been working with a friend of mine from Japan on this, and we're writing up some of these Kaizen patterns for practicing, is slack time. You know slack time, you know what I mean? Time to do things, you know, where I don't have to worry about doing the job directly. Uh, you could think in the early days, I don't know if Google still does this, but I know in the early days, Google used to give one day a week for to a developer to do whatever they want. And, and that gave a lot of, that's kind of like a slack time. I don't think they do it so much anymore from, from what I've heard. Uh, but back when they were kind of cool back in the day, they were really fun to work for. But, but really, you, you, you need slack time to improve. I can experiment. Maybe I find an order of magnitude better way to do something. Uh, or, or how do I know if, if I can't, if, if I'm always under the gun, yeah, I'm doing it, but how do I know there's not a better way? And how can I find a better way unless I take some breathing room to, first of all, I have to reduce waste. And if you don't have slack time, you have to get slack time. So that's, that's key to get slack time. And then I can start trying little experiments. So I can focus on the quality more if I have slack time. I might find things that I'm duplicating or wasteful. That gives me more slack time. But here's one problem that I see people doing with slack time. They have slack time, and then they take all these other tasks that they have over here and just shift them left. Well, that's a waste of your slack time. Your slack time is not supposed to be just to go to the beach and have a beer, you know, but you might have a beer, but you, you got to experiment. You try little things and get feedback and, well, this, this experiment, does this work? Does that work? Um, when I was on the mob team, mob programming, they, they, if you don't have slack time, you interject slack time into your process. So in the mob programming, what they did was every morning, the team has on their backlog something they want to learn about. It could be anything, some kind of cool new microservices thing or whatever. Nothing to do with the job. They spend one hour as a team with that, and that's almost better. So even if you get 15 minutes a day, that gives you some time to think. Uh, and it really helped set their day. So sometimes it might be about something they're working on. Sometimes it may not be, but they, they have time to kind of get their mind right. It's like a, a runner. Before a runner runs, it's important they do stretches, right? I'm not so agile and lean as I used to be, right, as I was a young guy. But, you know, the, the, if I was to run, it's important that I prepare before. You know, people do morning meditation, you know. I, I used to do Tai Chi a lot. I could still do some Tai Chi. But uh, it was important that I prepare with those breathing exercises and stuff. And so if we can find ways of doing that. There, there's one company I'm working for that what they do at the beginning of each morning, this one team, I just love it. I'm going to blog about it because it reminds me of like your morning exercises. Before the grind gets going, everybody's coming in, still waking up, having their coffee. You know, they're still trying to figure out what do they got to do for the day. What they do is they like run some reports from last night. Is there a little bit of mud? Let's kind of do a little bit of cleanup, refactoring cleanup. And it sets their mind right for the rest of the day. And it really helps focus them uh, for that. Now, they don't do this at the end of the day because they don't have time. Everybody's under the gun, phone calls. We've got to get this out before you go home. You can't go home and have dinner with your kids until you get all this done. But it's a good way to start the day. And it helps influence the rest of their day. It gets their mind right. And in fact, Spotify does a lot of things like this. If you really look at what Spotify is, they're focused on this innovation at times. And so Spotify, at least their model, now Spotify is evolving as they're becoming a bigger company, so they may not do this as well now as they used to. But they used to have this think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. And you'd go along. But one thing you have to watch, when you're tweaking, you might just micro-optimize. Every once in a while, you have to stop, take some slack time, rethink it, and maybe find a whole new, better way, an order of magnitude better way of doing the same thing. Like all my friends that are the best programmers that I know around the world, they always find a, they're almost like lazy programmers because they find a way to do the same thing you're doing with a lot less effort <laughs> with that. So it's, it's important that we get into some regular practices as we go along with this. This can really help me with my confidence. I need time for this. 
and I need to, and if I don't have time, I, I, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to improve because I'm just under the grind. Once I get time, then I can start experimenting and finding out what works, what doesn't work, reduce waste. And so interjecting some time helps. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So how can we, how can we interject some things into our rhythms? I've already talked about a couple things. But see, quality doesn't happen. We have to really think about it. We have to make it part of our process. So if we're doing Kanban type stuff or our, or our backlog or scrum or whatever, we can actually put some of the, we can have technical debt as part of our backlog. We can highlight that. Uh, yes, you can. In fact, you can even, Philip Crutchin talks about colorizing your backlog. Here's the way you can do it is too, is you can, you can make not only your regular defects, but technical debt. We can colorize that. So we know things that we have to deal with. It makes it visible to the team. If you don't, if you can't measure and see what your problems you have and make it visible, you're not going to improve it. We know something's wrong, but if we, until we can get our hands on it, we will not make it better. And part of, part of which helps with that is we have to have time to do that. So it's important, even if you're doing one of these weird agile processes, like Scrum, right? So even if you're using something like Scrum, you can still put key quality scenarios, or it can include quality items or technical debt reduction. That can be a quality task as part of your backlog that the team works on, and you could even have certain testing to validate that. And so, so that can be part of that. And in fact, even in TDD, something that was core to TDD was refactoring. And refactoring is like this pause points, where you can take this pause points to think about that. Now, something that helps me if I'm going to do refactoring is to have tools. And these two dudes, the refactoring dudes, Don and John, they did the first commercial tools. But re really, tools make me more confident that my refactorings are safe. It's going to kind of... I, I'm amazed at how much I was able to get... I can't live without tools like this myself when I'm writing code. Because doing, I've done it the old-fashioned way. Sometimes something took me 30 minutes, I'm doing it in half a minute, or one minute, or five minutes. That gives me lots more slack time to experiment and try things and reverse it. Whereas if it takes too long, I'm too worried about doing these types of things. And in fact, Kit Beck has a really good quote on, on here. Actually, the refactoring browser was included in the Simcom VisualWorks um, browser back in uh, 2000 when they hired Don and John because more people were using that browser than the main browser at the time. And it's like, let's do that. And, and actually, they, they were doing the code rewrites even faster than you could with the normal vi uh, vi VisualWorks browser. So then that, be, that took over the VisualWorks browser. But they open sourced it. This has been open sourced since the beginning. And many small talks have it. They just, John hates writing user interfaces. So he gives all the, under. he's really good at writing you, you know, uh, he lives and breathes like interpreters. He, that's what he likes in these rewrite type things. So he gives all that out. But like, if if you have your favorite small talk and want to implement the 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 GUI on it, th then he definitely opens that up. But Kit Beck talks about this is absolutely the greatest piece of programming software since the original browser. It changes the way you think. And absolutely, I can experiment. I can try all kinds of things. That's part of that experimenting and continuous learning. See if I can find a better way. And he, he said, when I started using, I spent about two hours at my old pace. But now, you know, it's, it's, you can do bigger refactorings and think them faster. You know, and so if, if, if you, you get Kit Beck to even get a little level of confidence, and that's good. So there's some ongoing quality activities that we can do to, to keep things going well. Oh, by the way, I was doing a function of the two previous speakers. So it depends on how I do my mathematics on the functions. If they each had 30-minute talks and then went way over, how much time do I really get, huh? Wait. Or does that mean my time got reduced, right, to put us back on time? But I'm going to keep us on time. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll be on time. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's okay. Gracias. Thank you. That's important. Yeah. That's because, yeah, well, that's it, yeah. That's why you want to go first, right? <laughs> so here's some ongoing quality activities that you can do. And I'm going to be right on time with the amount that I'm supposed to have one hour. I'm going to stay right with that. But you need to be able to monitor. If you can't see what's going on, I mean, we, we, we all have a process, even if you have a chaotic process. We need to look at what we're doing, how we're doing this, and let's monitor. Are there problems? Are there code smells? Are there things that are important to 
that add value? What do we value? Let's monitor and make it visible and look at it. Then we can do things about it. In fact, here's some stuff where we were looking at some continuous inspection. If you're worried about SQL injection and you have a persistence layer that everybody's supposed to use and your new developer doesn't know about it and bypasses it, you have a potential security problem. Maybe you're constantly, maybe you're pair of programming, you look at that, or before it gets checked in, you, you do some code checks. And you can automate a lot of these types of things. Uh, I wrote up a paper with a couple of these dudes up there uh, uh, on that, but we talked about some automated ways of doing that. And, of course, Smalltalk makes it easy to write a lot of automated tools. Uh, we had some examples of Java because some of the people I was working with there are Java guys with that. Um, and define triggers. This is another one we wrote. Condition that causes you to kind of look. Our, our uh, technical debt's getting too high. We can see problems. Or the performance, even though it's still good enough to release, we see it going the wrong direction. Maybe we need to have some quality tasks. Maybe we need to call, call in a performance expert. Let's get that expert in, hire him to for a week or whatever to help us figure out what's going on. Maybe we need to, you know, to do something with the database. Um, but, but that way we can trigger, and, but we need to be able to have some ways of letting us know when we move forward. And this is really, we need to, to reevaluate what do we value and how can we improve. So if we're going to do that, pause points help. Pause points are key. Now, originally with Agile, continuous improvement, retrospectives were, were a key part of that. But notice I have the Vegas kind of symbol for the Agile retrospectives, right? What happens in the retrospective stays in the retrospective. And that's like a two-edged sword, double-edged sword. Because on one hand, people want to feel comfortable that I can openly share whatever, what's going on, and people aren't going to get offended or use it as a weapon. We can we can have trust. We have this community of trust, and I can openly talk about what I saw some problems during the last couple of weeks or whatever, or the, during the last sprint or during the last six months. And we want that feedback. So you want to feel safe. On the other hand, a lot of times I see the other side. What happens in the retrospective never gets steps never get taken to move forward. So then that stays, and then it's no good. It's very important that you take small steps during your next, uh, as you're going forward. Not too much, because then if you fail, you don't know if some of it was good and some was bad, but if you're taking a lot of small steps, that's that experiment. So that helps with pause points. Another thing uh, that can help with pause points to help us uh, slow down and think and experiment with is we can have checklists. Like here we have uh, somebody that uh, I collaborate with, uh, James Thorpe, for, he's over in Europe with a large insurance company, and he ch shared like their checklist. But I know when I'm releasing software, I have certain things I want to make sure that I don't want to get out there and I can't roll back or if there's a problem. You want to make sure that you've, you've checked things off. And, and I don't know why in software sometimes we, we feel we're supposed to be too smart or above having checklists. But there's nothing wrong with checklists. Uh, the quality people, very smart people use these all the time. Doctors use them. They need to. I, I'm glad they use them. Airplane pilots, they have this checklist, make sure everything is right. Well, why can't we do that? And in fact, here's a Kanban board for some friends of ours at Mosaic Works over in, in Romania. And they had checklists even for their Kanban board and how they were going to move through their Kanban board. The team wrote this checklist, the team of developers, and they're doing... They're, they're doing continuous daily uh, deliveries, continuous improvement. Uh, they're going through. That. So even their daily meetings, they, if the feature is, is more than two days, stop and ask for help. So they wanted to make sure to check with themselves. And, and they own this. They're evolving this checklist. Uh, uh, does, does anyone need help, impediments, or unclear about any requirements? So they wrote these checklists. And, and, and so if, if you are trying to... Start and say, say you're going along and you want to gain more confidence and deliver faster and you feel that there's an issue, where do you start? Well, one way to start is you want to start with small, quick releases. That's part of the message I've had. Don't try to go these big things. Start getting feedback and monitor what's going on. And pick some low-hanging fr fruit. Make things visible. Maybe you colorize your backlog. Create quality-related checklists. And make the attention to the code quality visible through the whole team. Because if you don't value it, not just for the sake of, 
Oh, so if small methods are cool, pretty soon we all have one-line methods. If that's what you're measuring and if that's what you're valuing, but you really try to value what is what is quality code and what does the team value and, and bring that in because that'll spread throughout the meme set. And so a lot depends on where you are and where you start and how much risk. So generally, I, I see the more risk, obviously, the, like small teams, for example. Generally, you don't have to worry about it. The architecture can kind of evolve quickly. But if you get on larger organizations and they have large teams, uh, there's usually a lot more risk involved with doing this. So my final to leave you here with before lunch is I have some values to drive. Since values drive practice, I'm going to call you to action. Start with, I mean, hopefully most people in small talk do this already. Uh, they already have. So this is pretty natural for a lot of small talkers. Though sometimes I've been in small talk companies where they they still forget this and, and keep the code clean as you go refactoring tools and, and small talk that's where it started it's easy to do you learn the shortcuts or even if you use the menu items and make things visible you know and that part of it is this continuous improvement as you go and get into some good daily practices as, as you go along that way you could sustain your your development for the long run and, and so whatever the main thing is do whatever works best for the team and adapt as you go, but allow yourself some pause points and allow yourself some time to improve. So here's the Agile Manifesto, but it seems like some friends of mine have been trying to rewrite it lately. So, you know, not to let them one-up me, I want to uh, do the same. I've been working with a friend of mine. So, you know, here's the Agile. They were really like individuals and interactions and uh, customer collaboration, working software. Well, I like the Lazy Manifesto. To me, I think this goes a little bit better. I've been working with a colleague of mine, Kiro-san. There is, we were like, we're running, this is almost the Kaizen principle, the Kaizen manifesto. We want to uh, uncover lazy ways of developing a valuable products by doing it and helping others to do it. So keeping Slack over fully utilizing all the time. Small, high quality software over large, complex. Doing only what is necessary. Doing less to deliver the same. All my best programming friends do that. They're able to do less. So we try to do the same with less. They're almost like the lazy programmer, but they're smarter, actually. So, of course, we don't want to not have our 12 principles as well, so we put together our 12 principles. Doing nothing is always an option. You know, it's okay to do nothing sometimes, because if we do something, sometimes we create more of a mess. Sometimes we need to just step back and do nothing. Uh, we seek to min minimize it rather than just keeping it high. We only stay with value, just a value. It's not always good to increase the velocity. That doesn't necessarily give you more value. You might get a lot of more tasks and you look good to the boss, but are you really reach delivering value to the end customer? We try to eliminate tasks or combine tasks, rearrange them. Oh, we're not afraid of eliminating our own tasks. Ooh, my own job's going to go away. That's always scary, but hey, I mean, if I'm not adding value, maybe I need to go away and go do something different. We, uh, we only work hard to make our work easier and safer. So, um, and, we, and we try to, we always look to help, we look to get help when we provide help to others with minimal effort. Oh, and then, I, of course, we don't want to just have 12 because other manifestos have 12, right? So, so I want to, stop by with this is when I think of agile and to me agile is not blindly just doing something doing something is like one truth you say I'm going to do okay Kent Beck says I have to do XP this is how you have to do it oh Joe you didn't write the test first Uncle Bob you know over there Joe you didn't like sorry you're not doing TDD right that's like that's like being uh, more like dogmatic religious about it it should really do whatever adds value. How we work together is going to be different than how we work together. And we have to find and adapt that and continuously learn. And so the Agile mindset really focuses on there. So I always talk about don't blindly do something. Early on, it's good to learn it by the book. You're going to learn TDD. You might as well do it TFD, Test First Development. Learn it by the book. But then it's like that... That shoe ha re, we learn it by the book, that's a shoe, but then the ha is now I figure out what works best for me and adapt it, and then re, let's come to something even a lot better, an order of magnitude better. So it's a journey, it just doesn't happen overnight, it's a commitment, but if we do a lot of small steps, it's just like anything in life, it takes a lot of hard work. If I'm going to be a musician, i got to put the time in, practice, continuous improve, 
uh, deliberate practices, follow through. So here's hopefully some takeaways. Values drive your practice. We should constantly be trying to improve, but we, we need time, slack time to do that. Code quality and delivery size are key, so deal with technical debt. And I talked about many level, things that can help with confidence, such as testing. Uh, so there's a lot of safe refactorings. Uh, uh, keeping things smaller helps me feel better with that. Um, and I've got some links because I'll definitely make the slides available. But it's very good So to be here. Uh, in Argentina for my first time. I've been wanting to get down here for a long time since I have some friends down here that I've collaborated with. So, gracias. Uh, very happy to be here, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. And distributed teams can make things harder because you're not quite co-located. So obviously a lot of the principles of some of the agile things say, oh, we'll just put them together, but you can't always do that. So I've worked on where there's six scrum teams, four in the U.S., one in China, one in India. They're doing very, uh, it's, it's very regulated type software, medical domain, medical big health scanning things and stuff like that. We were in two-week sprints and stuff like that. But you get what you measure. So you got to be careful. So with that, in that example, it was required that you had 85% code coverage before you could integrate and check in at the end of each two-week sprint. So let me ask you, what kind of test do you think they were writing, if that's what you measure? Yeah. <laughs> Which I would rather have 100% good test and lousy test coverage than 100% coverage with lousy tests. It's, it's, so it's important. What do you value? So when they valued that, that's what you got. So with distributed teams, you still want to make things visible. You can still have regular meetings. You can still share screens. I've worked with people remotely a lot. It's, it's a little bit harder, but you can still have ways to do that. I still prefer the sticky notes. I was talking, I, I was actually in Agile Brazil a couple days ago and gave a talk there. We were talking about 50 years from now. I look for programming environments, so people that are creating programming environments like Elliot or other people, I want where you can give me the stickies where I can actually virtually be meeting with you, and then it's like I'm really doing the stickies and moving things around, and plus I can have other types of feedback type things going on with those types of programming environments. Smalltalk kind of started that, even at Xerox Park in the 70s and everything else, they were looking at this collaborative thing. But, but, but it is challenging, but you get what you value. So even with distributed teams, we should still make sure to value that clean code. We should still be looking at the delivery size. We can still do a lot of these things, and people do that with, with distributed teams. But you, but I, I don't want to overemphasize just to measure. It's what you value, but it's important to measure, but not as a weapon. Too often people get afraid of measurements, especially us that are writing software, because you're going to use it as a weapon against me. Uh, I don't get my bonus now. No, we're, you, the team should measure themselves and look at ways to improve. That's what works the best for me. So even a distributed team, maybe we find good ways to collaborate distributedly. It's always more of a challenge. I think there's a need for finding good tools for distributed. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen some good tools, decent tools. There's another one back here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she was mainly with distributed teams, and she has some really good uh, tools that she uses that she recommends. But I would look into ways to work on programming these up yeah. on a regular basis. Um, it's it's really a it's a nice methodology. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Technique. Yeah. Technique. Good technique. It's a good practice, and practices drive value. Yeah, really good. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So what do you do when you make a refactoring and you push it, uh, it and then other people doesn't like it? 
Well, you never have that problem with mob programming, by the way, because right, right. But if you have, but if you're pair programming or you're individually programming, you may have. But that's where the team needs to come with that value. So sometimes people have uh, the, the team gets together and do some code reviews. Sometimes though, code reviews become finger pointing. That's bad. It's really meant to let's try to uplift and come to a common agreement and a shared meme set. We're all sharing the vision and values. What do we value as a team and what helps us? So we have to look at what's adding value and how to improve that. And that's part of that learning stuff. So you said you had a second yeah, one? What do you think people don't use the problem? Just reasoning, extract methods, and that's all. Some people don't even know that they can change factoring to make changes. Is that a problem with the tools, it's a well, I, I don't think it's a problem. It's a problem with the mindset. So, like Linda Rising talks about the agile mindset, and the way uh, it's the same way with the mind. So, if I come into your team, and I don't know that I am empowered to make those kind of things, I feel I have to follow what you already have there. That's where you have to really encourage. It's okay. It's it, that's what I like about with XP. It was supposed to be we all own this together. It's not yours, and it's not mine. It's us. We are doing it together. And how can we make those? So, so we have to let people know that. But I see, I see it less with small talk, but I see it a lot with Java and C Sharp and other languages where people get stuck and they come in the company and they're the junior guy and they're trying to learn and you're the senior guy. You wrote it. I see your name on there. Can I really change what you did? Yes. Can I change what Elliot did? If I'm working? Yeah. I, I should be empowered to. He would want, he would encourage me to. And we need to create environments where people feel happy and safe to do that. And so that's part of the team needs to start creating an environment. So that was that was one of the practices I'm trying to kind of talk about, but the team has to make those. So beyond the tools, um, what, what do you say about the necessary trust that you have to build between team members even before you start using tools, especially in your teams? To me, the, the that's number one, actually. Tools are great, but tools are just, tools are tools. And I, obviously I like tools. I came from the refactory, you know, we got, we like tools. But tools are not silver bullets. Tools are things that we use to help us do things. But it's the people side that's key, building trust and encouraging people and let's uplift people and learn together. And so that, that that's number one. And so building environments, you could use tools to help with that, but tools are not the, the answer for that. You, we have to really kind of get people working together. And that's where if I'm on your team and then every time I try to do something, you're attacking me and I feel attacked and I'm threatened, then I'm feeling uh, fearful of making those types of changes. So how can we remove those kind of barriers where well, I feel comfortable that I can do that type of stuff. But the team has to do that. There's all kinds of, I don't have enough time to talk about that now, but there's all kinds of books and other people that's dedicated their life to talk about how to do that. But to me, that's number one. And then the two, obviously, I, I, I'm not against, I like tools. Tools can make, can help me measure or automate. Like one of my patterns is automate first. That's what testing is. Automate as soon as you can, what you can, that's, that's tedious and can be error prone. So refactoring does that. Refactoring tools do that. Testing. But but that should be the second thing. Okay? Yeah, everybody's hungry, I'm sure, and wants to eat, and we're way over, so. By the way, I'm here for a few days. I always like talking to new people and meeting new people, so, and hacking together, too. I did a hackathon, actually, in Brazil at Agile Brazil, and that was fun. I could do a hackathon. Okay. That's it.